Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Welcome to our Westchester Weekly Update. It is Monday, July 11th, and I'm happy to be joined over the course of this update by our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, uh, our Director of Economic Development, Bridget Gibbons, and our Director of Programs and Policies, Martha Lopez, uh, who will help join us in some of the economic development announcements. We also have with us Sherry Rosen Asher, who's also Director of Policy and Programs handling our in our economic development area. And uh, we'll give you an update on a host of different issues that we think are relevant, hopefully of interest to you in terms of where we are in Westchester County. Um, let me begin by talking about the most recent issue that people have discussed, and that is the outbreak of monkeypox that has occurred here in the United States. Uh, it is a disease that, a viral disease that is not uh, common uh, to uh, this hemisphere. And so when cases do occur, uh, it really attracts some attention. The CDC has identified that there are 767 cases nationally. New York has the largest number of cases, New York State, with 153 cases, followed by California and Illinois. Not surprising given the population of California, New York, and Illinois as among the top five states in population. There is a bit of a slight data lag from the CDC to what's on the New York State website. New York State Department of Health reports that uh, as of the 8th of this month, uh, today being the 11th, there were 174 cases, and uh, New York City uh, has 160 of those 174 cases. There are 14 cases that are of monkeypox that are outside of New York City, six of them here in Westchester County, uh, four in Suffolk County, and then one each in a number of other counties. So it is a very low level of outbreak. It is inevitable that we're going to make comparisons between monkeypox and COVID because we're still in the two and a half year period of the, of the COVID um, pandemic, but uh, there really is no significant comparison between these two diseases. And I think primarily because COVID is airborne in its uh, communication from one person to another, uh, monkeypox requires a skin-to-skin -skin contact, and that is much less frequent uh, in the way it can spread. However, having six cases in Westchester does not make it invisible and as part of the larger number of situations. Now, there has been vaccination available right at the outset uh, for those uh, either that are concerned about contracting monkeypox or have monkeypox. And uh, our plans for right now is to try to target the vaccines that are available to those groups that are most vulnerable within those social networks of individuals that, that are primarily vulnerable. We have received at this point 450 doses of uh, vaccine, and we're distributing them through medical facilities to try to help uh, reach those people that are most vulnerable. The uh, 100 doses of this MPX vaccine has been given to the Open Door Neighborhood Health Center, and they have a series of locations around the county in Port Chester, in Sleepy Hollow, in Ossining, and elsewhere. Uh, 100 doses have been given to the Westchester Medical Center. There have been doses supplied to the White Plains Hospital and uh, some other locations, St. John's Riverside Hospital, Hope Community Center. In each of those different situations, what we tell individuals who are concerned that they might be uh, exposed to monkeypox, certainly to look for the uh, various indications of the disease, which would be lesions on hand or elsewhere, uh, and then also certain other things that might give you the, uh, the sense that you might be vulnerable to this, go to your medical professional. Your medical professional will then reach out to one of these existing health facilities to determine how best to get you the vaccine. At this point, because of the limited amount of vaccine supply, we're not opening up to a general vaccination clinic as we've done with COVID. There are some locations, New York City, uh, Suffolk County, that have done that. And as you may follow the press reports, when New York City opened it up uh, to the general population, they were immediately swamped with more demand than there was available vaccinations without a next uh, source of vaccinations coming to follow. So we want to avoid that by working through existing medical facilities where the vaccinations can be easily uh, administered, and then to have people come to, to have them be checked by the doctors, investigate to determine uh, what their vulnerability is to this disease, and then uh, to vaccinate where possible. As we get additional supplies from New York State DOH, we will then make more of those available. And if we do see the benefit in having a general public vaccination, we will do that. But for the individuals that are concerned that they might be exposed to monkeypox, the first step is to contact your healthcare professional. If you don't have one, if you're indigent, then one of the local uh, qualified, federally qualified health centers around the county, the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center, the Greenberg Neighborhood Health Center, the aforementioned Open Door. Uh, there's one in Peekskill that, that uh, provides the same services in the Peekskill area as a Peekskill uh, health uh, uh, facility. And uh, with some of the other ones that are 
out there. We hope to be able to, to make a direct connection for you, the individual. Uh, but, but they will not be at this stage of the game until we get a, a guarantee, greater supply, a general vaccination opportunity. So you'll have to go through your medical professional, and, and they will be able to know which locations that they can book you an appointment to go and get a vaccination. Uh, given the amount of vaccination that we have available, we think that's the best way to reach the people that, we, that need to have it on a basis uh, that's urgent. Again, six cases in Westchester. That's up one over the last two to three weeks. So this is not uh, highly communicable in the way that COVID is, and it should be a source of some comfort for the general population. Monkeypox is a rare viral infection. It does not usually cause serious illness, even in its full-blown form. It can result in hospitalization, and in some severe cases, uh, it, it can have fatalities. But it's, it's rare that it gets to that level of seriousness. So the health uh, officials have been advising us uh, and the other counties as to how best to respond to this and this is the the structure that we have you should know the symptoms you can find that out online you can go into the westchestergov.com uh, website and uh, look for monkeypox the information will pop up that you can look at you can look for it in general on the internet and they'll give you some information that would be helpful uh, you can contact your medical health professional they will know how best to handle it but we want to give you the confidence that this is not a widespread situation on the level of covid and uh, mass vaccinations are not recommended at this stage of the game vaccinations in those situations where a person may have been exposed know they may have been exposed or not sure they may have been exposed, but potentially exposed, or they're in a vulnerable population. That's the best way to handle these situations. I want to highlight that uh, on, the, on the issue of COVID, which uh, never goes away, we're now almost two and a half years through this. What we're seeing now across the county is uh, an a oscillation somewhere between 2,500 to 3,500 active cases over a period of time. The numbers go up a little bit, they come down a little bit. The most recent number that we saw was uh, 3,356 active cases, meaning people that were infected over the last 10 days that haven't gone through the protocol. Slightly higher from a week ago, we were at 3,100. But the 3,300 cases as of the most recent number is down a few hundred cases from a few days before when they were 3,500 active cases. So there's this sort of range that we're dealing with. Probably the most important statistics for you to know of all the active cases, we've tracked this now over a two months period of time, we have never reached any more than 5% of all the active cases being hospitalized, meaning 3,300 people at this point in time ill, maybe 3,000 on another day, 5% or less had to be hospitalized. That puts us in the vicinity of 150 hospitalizations, and that is an encouraging sign. 95% of the people that have active cases of COVID at this moment in time will not need hospitalization. They can recover at home if they isolate themselves and, and take proper care and protection on the assumption that they have been vaccinated. The fatality rate over the course of time as more people have gotten the disease and there's been less fatality, we are now under 1% of all the people that have ever gotten COVID that have suffered fatality under 1% of all the people that have been infected. Now, that number was much higher than that in the beginning of this pandemic. We were at 4 or 5% fatality in the very early stages of this. That number has continually dropped as people get infected, and I'm sure we all have examples of it, and we've talked about our own cases already, uh, of people that get the disease, they go through it, they're sick for a day or two, or they're not sick at all, uh, but they would go through the waiting period, uh, no symptoms uh, beyond uh, mild headache, a little fatigue, things of that nature, having been vaccinated. And generally triple vaccinated, and in many cases, uh, vaccinated four times, uh, which is the, the original two-shot uh, uh, protocol followed by a couple of booster shots. The booster shots and the protocol, four shots in very general terms, just so that you know where we are. We're two and a half years into this. Vaccines have been available after year one, so uh, we're about a year and a half into the vaccination period. Westchester is a high level of vaccination, over 80, 85 percent people vaccinated at whatever level. And we in Westchester County are seeing a very low fatality rate and a fairly low hospitalization rate. And when you look at the hospitalization rate compared to the fatality rate, what it tells you is the vast majority of people that are hospitalized, seriously ill, enough to be hospitalized, still wind up recuperating and going home. So that should be a good parameter for where we are with COVID. Now, having said that, the key tool has been, has always been vaccinations. We do not mandate vaccinations, but frankly, uh, whatever your philosophy is, vaccinations have clearly made a difference in the severity of, this, of the cases. Pre-vaccination, we had far more fatalities than we have had post-vaccination being made available. We now have free COVID vaccines for children ages six months to five years of age, 
throughout the summer. County Health Department is offering free pediatric Moderna vaccines by appointment to children who fall into that six months to five year old period of time. You may remember at one point, we didn't provide vaccinations below the age of 12. And then when uh, medical science uh, allowed for us to do it was the age of five to 12. And now under the age of five, that is available. It is on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon at the County Health Clinic in White Plains. The County Health Clinic is at 134 Court Street, on Court Street between Post Road and Quaropus Street. So the County Health Clinic, not the County Center, County Health Clinic, on Fridays, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, you can have young children ages six months to five years of age uh, receive the uh, COVID vaccination. Um, now, there may be a popular belief that kids under that age can't get COVID. That's a false belief. I have a grandson who's uh, just turned five years old and he had COVID about a year ago. Uh, children can become very sick from this. And uh, so we want the same protection for the youngest amongst us and uh, to be fully vaccinated against COVID. Uh, we have seen uh, over the period of time that uh, the vaccinations come into play, we're resuming normalcy. We're gonna talk in a few minutes about how we're doing in our beaches and our pools and our ethnic festivals and Bicycle Sundays. So much of the life that we had to put on hold in 2020 and to some extent in 2021 is now back uh, in, in progress and it is back uh, you, you know, fairly fully. So we're confident that if people are vaccinated, they may get the disease, but they won't suffer. They'll have very little likelihood of, of hospitalization, even smaller likelihood of fatality. And we're finding that we're not seeing spread that's coming specifically from outdoor summertime events. So it's all a very good sign, and we're very hopeful as we go forward. Uh, let me remind you that when you get uh, the vaccine for, for children, if it's the first time they're being vaccinated, it is the same two-shot protocol. You must go 28 days apart from the first shot to the second shot. So uh, other age groups can also be vaccinated if they need a third shot or a fourth shot. We'll do that on Fridays at the uh, White Plains Clinic from one o'clock to three o'clock. So from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock, the, uh, the under age five, and then older, any age, from one o'clock to three o'clock at the White Plains Clinic, 134 Court Street. You can go on our line, uh, on our website, westchestergov.com, get all the information you need. Just click around and you'll find it. And the appointments are what's essential. You must have an appointment. We do not want walk-ins. We wanna be able to plan uh, the amount of assistance that we can have for this. So the good news is, is that we seem to be working on a COVID strategy that is working. We have not had to mandate anything to help reduce it. Uh, we seem to be in a stable situation with COVID, and that is a more communicable disease. We have a monkeypox strategy that we hope will be successful. So far, with only six cases and a population of a million people, we, we believe that that is also in very good shape. I'm going to move on to talk just a little bit about crime. We made a point to talk uh, uh, earlier this year that repeated a couple of weeks ago that crime in Westchester is down. We gave you statistical data uh, that showed that uh, uh, index crime, which compiles violent crimes and property crimes, that in all of those different categories, crime was down in Westchester County. And, and as I said, we're not talking about other jurisdictions. Uh, what you see on television uh, certainly uh, uh, represents things that are happening inside the city of New York, perhaps in other parts of the state, other parts of the country. In Westchester County, crime is down. But what's important to note is when we have the, the most uh, concerning crime is violent crime, a crime that is committed with guns, gunplay. And to report this weekend, we had no direct shootings of any individuals in Westchester County. We reported the same thing last week. No shootings of individuals uh, and certainly no fatalities that have come from that. There always is serious crime. There are events that happen uh, that uh, police have to work on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The county police and all the local police departments, we've had incidents over the last week, a serious incident in New Rochelle. Uh, that, that uh, we were able to capture the individuals involved. Uh, an incident in Yonkers where there was gunplay, but no one was, was harmed or hurt uh, by the gunplay. And also, there are success stories out there. The Westchester County Police Detectives worked closely with the Mount Vernon Police Detectives in the Violent Crime Task Force. Uh, they've been working on trying to reduce gun violence, and they had two separate stops this weekend that resulted in the recovery of a number of illegal handguns and the arrest of two known uh, individuals that have been involved in violent acts uh, in the city of Mount Vernon. So this is an example of the police working in cooperation and ferreting out, quote unquote, the bad guys, uh, and at the same time uh, knowing that the streets of Westchester have been and continue to be safe. 
and with, with no gun shootings, no gun fatalities over the last uh, two weekends, over a number of weekends, but just as we're starting to report that during the summer, uh, we want to give you an accurate picture. And if numbers uh, spike up, we will tell you that. We're not looking to hide anything. But we want you to understand that the rhetoric and the reality are two different things. And as you hear people try to push a narrative about what's happening, you should know in Westchester County, that's the jurisdiction that we have responsibility for here in this government, uh, that, that the results have been positive. The results are also positive in the area of economic development. Uh, one of the things that uh, is important to us is that we grow the economy and work through the difficult in, uh, inflationary times we have. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask Ken Jenkins to join us to go over once again some of the things we're trying to do to deal with the high cost of everything right now within the context of what a county government can do. I often say this, we're not the state, we're not the federal government. There are things we can do, the things we can't do. But within the process of how do we incentivize uh, a stronger economy. We have working on the job uh, an, an impressive team of individuals uh, who are working very hard and in creative ways to help us grow our, uh, our economic development. So I'm going to ask uh, Bridget Gibbons, our Director of Economic Development, to join me here. Also, she'll be joined by Martha Lopez, who's Director of Program and Policy. And uh, they're going to talk a little bit about our pros and contracts. That's a a quotation name that will talk a little bit about our uh, economic development effort focused on minority and women business-owned enterprises. So uh, Bridget and Martha, take it away. We'll give you a little helping hand here. <laughs> oh, that's so great. So that you can, uh, you can step up to the podium. Thank you. Bridget. Gibbons. Literally. <laughs> Thank you, County Executive. As the County Executive just mentioned, the mission of the Office of Economic Development is to implement programs and conduct events to help grow the Westchester County economy. We're always listening to bus the business community and responding to the needs that they're communicating to us. Uh, in 2022, one of the critical needs uh, that they were expressing was that they were confronted with the inability to hire employees. So we kicked into gear and began holding in-person job fairs that bring together employers and job seekers. We conducted job fairs in construction, hospitality, healthcare, and advanced manufacturing, and plan to do more in the balance of 2022. We've also heard from our MWBE business owners, minority and women-owned business owners, that they need assistance in gaining greater access to contracting opportunities with the county to grow in order to grow their businesses. In response, we've been focusing on ways to bring together more, bring, bring more opportunities for our diverse business. Businesses. Examples include, we hired Keisha Palmer Cousins, who's an MWBE expert, to, to work directly with on one-on-one -on -one with our, our MWBEs to increase their chances to obtain a county contract. Uh, we partnered with NIPA and, then, and the MTA recently to help our MWBEs learn about opportunities in working with these larger uh, organizations. And we're asking our, our county departments who contract with nonprofit organizations to encourage them uh, to, to encourage the nonprofit organizations to hire MWBEs for any services that they contract uh, or subcontract. We're practicing what we preach. We're being very deliberate about making sure to hire MWBE vendors for any products or services that the Office of Economic Development needs. And on this Thursday, July 14th, we will be conducting an event that will bring together MWBEs, service disabled veteran owned businesses and disadvantaged business enterprises together with our county departments who issue contracts for goods and services. Bringing our diverse business owners face to face with the county departments really breaks down barriers and starts to build relationships which will increase opportunities for our businesses to gain contracts and grow their businesses. Martha Lopez, our director for MWBE Business Development, um, will provide more information on Thursday's event. I want to thank Martha and Sherry Rosen Asher, who have been working really hard to make this event a success. Um, and um, for more information about our business diversity programs, you can go to our website, which is westchestercatalyst.com slash MWBE. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. And as Bridget mentioned, uh, economic development plays a very big role within Westchester County. So if you are a bookkeeper, or if you are an accountant, or you know, a, a professional that wants to do business with us, I encourage you to attend our event, which is going to be this coming Thursday at 9 a.m. at the New York Power Authority, located at 123 Main Street in White Plains. How can you do business with us? Well, first, I encourage everyone to register with us, westchestergov.com or westchestercatalyst.com. Please register with us because 
the information that you will get, believe me, is going to be so beneficial, especially for the minority and women on business. We expect to see you there. Go online, register with us, and do business with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I want to thank Bridget Gibbons and uh, Martha Lopez for their work on this. I also want to recognize uh, with us in the audience is Sherry Rosen Asher, who is a critical part of our economic development team as well. Uh, she does a number of different projects. Uh, she does outreach to the local chambers of commerce, and uh, she and I spend a lot of time visiting with those uh, important economic development teams that are out there as well. They're looking to work in every one of the little downtowns that we have, whether they're villages or cities or towns. And so uh, Bridget and her full team, that also includes Deb Novick, who's reported with us here before, uh, and uh, Rosa Ramon is a part of that team, and we have a lot of other work going on, and Corazon Pineda as well uh, from Yonkers. So we're very appreciative, Bridget, of your leadership and your team's leadership, and we look forward to this event coming up on Thursday the 14th. So thank you, uh, thank you all those. Uh, Ken Jenkins is going to join me. Uh, we're going to give you an update uh, over the weekend. We gave you an update over the weekend of crime statistics. Keep in mind what I reported on was this past weekend. It doesn't reference things that have happened earlier in the year. I don't want anybody to think that crime does not exist in Westchester County or there isn't gunplay from time to time. But when you listen to the weekend report on the radio and television and you hear that X number of people uh, were shot in Queens or something happened in the subways, you need to have a comparison to that, and that's the comparison I'm giving you, which is this past weekend there were no uh, shootings in Westchester County of individuals uh, and none that uh, turned fatal. So. The other thing that we like to report on, particularly during the summertime, is what's happening at our parks and recreational facilities. And, and in part, it's tied into the fact that COVID has really, over the last two summers, reduced the, uh, the willingness and ability of people to go out and enjoy the various parks. Now, you may remember that we kept open all of our major park facilities over the course of the two summers, 20 and 21. Uh, Playland was closed in 20. We were managing it in 20 and 21. We had it closed in 20. Uh, there was a state regulation that did not open amusement parks. In 21, it opened late because we didn't get the approval to open it until somewhat later in the year. We don't manage Playland now, but nonetheless, Playland is open. And uh, of the other facilities that we have, we suspended our ethnic heritage festivals in 20 and in 21. We were concerned that we could not conduct uh, those events, which are great fun, uh, without people being up close and personal and the potential of COVID spread. We have now resumed those starting back in May with the Polish Heritage Festival. We had some this weekend. We'll report on all of this in a second. Uh, and then also our pools and beaches, which did not close during the summers of 20 and 21, but we had reduced um, uh, uh, rules of, uh, of operation so that there were things that we did in 20 and that we did to some degree in 21 to try to avoid the spread of COVID. And we had reduced turnout, but they were still open in places uh, that were not opened elsewhere around us. Now this year, since we fully opened and we've made the pools uh, and the beaches free during the week from, uh, from fees to get onto the beach, Glen Island is the one that's open during the week, and the four pools that are open during the week, we've had a spike in attendance. Just to give you a few numbers, comparing this year for this week, the last seven days, to a year ago. Tibbetts Pool in Yonkers, this week, 10,474 visitors. A year ago, 5,252 visitors. Year to date, this year, 25,162 visitors. Year to date, a year ago, 13,582. Saxon Woods Pool in White Plains, 9,836 visitors. This year, 4,813 visitors a year ago. Year to date, 24,000 this year, 13,000 last year. Sprain Pool in, uh, in Yonkers, 7,358 uh, this year. For the week, it's 3,187 uh, a year ago. Year to date, 17,000 Sprain Ridge, 9,000 a year ago. Now keep in mind, Sprain Ridge was closed in 2018 because we had to reconstruct the, uh, the pool that had been opened briefly in 2017, and we had a, a pool that had been closed for eight years as a second pool. All of that had to be repaired, so the, the pool wasn't even opened in 2018. It opened in 2019, and then we immediately had COVID protocol in 20 and 21. So we're starting to get closer to what a normal sprain uh, pool year would be. Now, Wilson Woods is a bit of a different situation. We've mentioned uh, already that the wave pool uh, was not able to be opened this year for season. There was a pipe uh, that broke underneath it, 
and now there's work being done to complete it. The pipe delivery, the replacement pipe delivery and the installation will be happening this week. The scheduled completion is Thursday, fingers crossed. Uh, there'll be testing on Thursday. If testing is successful on Thursday, we'll identify the reopening date. We don't know if we can reopen it immediately thereafter. All of that will be announced publicly as we announce the closing of it. That's the Wilson Woods Wave Pool, which is the major water feature at Wilson Woods. We still have a spray park, we have a lazy river. There's three water features that are still open at Wilson Woods and with that, we still had a modified attendance of 2,200 people. Uh, and compared to where we were a year ago, a year ago when we had the wave pool available, 2,300 people. So a slight decrease over the year with a major piece of the puzzle not in place. So you can imagine what we would have done uh, had we had that. And then year to date, the numbers are reflective of the wave pool not being open. Uh, but Tibbet, Saxon, Spring Ridge, all good. Glen Island Beach. 3,800 visitors in the past week compared to 1,200 uh, a year ago. Now keep in mind, we did not have use of Glen Island throughout 2020 because we donated that to the state to do uh, drive-through testing for COVID. So we've had an interruption in Glen Island service. And in Croton Point Park Beach, uh, we've had 1,400, almost 1,500 visitors in the past week compared to 750. That's a doubling in the amount of people from this year to last year. So the bottom line is in our pools and beaches, aided by the weather, whenever you have bad weather, people don't go to the pool. We had this past weekend a perfect weekend to go to the beaches or pool. It was warm and sunny. It did not rain, uh, and that helped us a lot. Rain doesn't stop a golfer necessarily. Uh, they try to soldier through no matter what. And our six public golf courses continue to outperform a year ago, which was an outstanding performance a year ago. Uh, Dunwoody, Dunwoody Golf Course, 1,400 plus rounds of golf over the last week compared to 1,100 rounds of golf a week ago. Uh, Saxon Woods Golf and the Scarsdale site, 1,800 versus 1,500 a year ago. And all on down the line, every one significant increase in Sprain Lake and Yonkers and Maple Moor and White Plains and Mohansic and Yorktown and Hudson Hills and Austin. Every one of them outperformed where we were a year ago. You step back and say, what does this all mean? This is your tax dollars at work. We have 55 recreational facilities in Westchester County that are available for you to enjoy. We make, uh, we make great point to notice that uh, we've, we've repaired the North County Trailway and the South County Trailway. We connect, reconnected the Bronx River Pathway so you can walk or bike on those facilities. We have six nature centers, the marshlands, the Reed Sanctuary, uh, a trail side, Cranberry Lake, Lenoir Preserve, all of those are available for you to go and have a nature walk if that's what you choose to do on the weekend or during the weekday. And we have parks with multiple of activities. The huge Ward Pound Ridge facility entered through Lewisboro and Pound Ridge. Uh, Kensico Dam Plaza, which we'll talk about in a second, and the six public golf courses uh, are in terrific shape. I talked to some folks who are familiar with golf, and they say the golf courses look great, and we're getting a, a strong demand. A lot of people going through the golf courses, and that tends to wear out a golf course, and yet we still have uh, very good uh, working circumstances. And if you're not a golfer, let me tell you, you should go to Maple Moor Golf Course. There's an outdoor deck and an indoor restaurant. It's terrific. It's called North Street Tavern. Uh, it, it is operated independently. Uh, it's part of our complex, but we have a, an independent operator who's operating it. You go down there in the evening and you sit and you have a cocktail and a bite to eat. Uh, you'll enjoy yourself looking out over the golf course. And we have similar dining opportunities at each of our golf courses. But these are the things, uh, we didn't create all of them within this administration. These are uh, traditional activities that have happened over the course of time. What we have done is we've invested money in upgrading them and fixing things that are broken, whether they're pools or the Miller House, uh, Washington headquarters historic site. And we're getting a response to that effort. And when people are coming and if they can enjoy the pools or the beaches for free, uh, because of the economic times right now, then we're showing you that we're making this government, the services of this government, available to you so you can actually enjoy it. And uh, I certainly think that Westchester County's recreational opportunities are second to none, uh, given the size and scope of our county. Counties that are smaller than us, counties that even that are larger than us, look at us with a great degree of envy that we've allocated this much recreation. Uh, and, in, and we're still going through COVID, so recreation still matters to people in order to keep themselves uh, together and sane. So um, we've mentioned uh, before, we had a press conference about this, we've mentioned it, we want to repeat it again. We are taking certain steps to try to make things available financially for individuals who are going through this inflationary time. Uh, and I want Ken Jenkins to go over that list again, just to remind you what it is that we're working on within the county government. Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. 
and certainly again because of the county executive's leadership and the continued investment between everyone on the team to be able to look at everything we have to be able to have all of the Westchester residents as the county executive just pointed out um, it's there it's your parks we say that every time in each one of the parks where we are able to go out and talk to people it's that investment into your parks and making sure that we leave things better than when we walk through the door the day one. The tremendous events investments that the county executive has led and ensured that we've got with our entire team have been tremendous. And one of those was talking about the things that we could do so people could get to enjoy them much more. And as you heard from the, the, the uh, numbers the county executive pointed out, many people are taking advantage of those. Last month we talked about the things that uh, people really enjoy, which is that free transportation um, throughout the B-Line system and in paratransit, so it didn't matter whatever public system that you're utilizing, whether it's our, our public transportation with B-Line or with paratransit, that is free up until September 6th, right after Labor Day, and people are taking advantage of that as well. Um, in the county parks, the pools, as county executive mentioned, the pools and the beach are open Monday through Thursday without a fee. You still need to be a Westchester resident or have a county park pass. You need to bring ID with you to take advantage of that. Um, in places that parking is a, um, a fee, that you still have to pay a fee to park. And that's really more to make sure that the other folks that are, are renting the other facilities in our county parks get a chance to enjoy them as well with the parking um, structure being the way that it is, it's not unlimited parking at the facilities. But beaches and pools being free, at, um, and as county executive pointed out, even with a fantastic re weekend that we had, um, now, Monday through the Thursday, we're having some additional great weather like we have today. It's absolutely a beautiful day to be at one of the, the four county beaches or um, Glen Island um, Beach, or the pools that we have available to you, right? Croton Point Beach is the one that's not open during the week. There's additional construction and investment going on there. Again, trying to manage through the, the pandemic and going to now to make sure we are continuing to invest in all of those county properties as county executives led through this um, particular effort. We also added in free parking at the county um, bus, you know, the county facilities, parking facilities for the Metro North commuters. So that's at the county center or the North White Plains Station. Either one of those, and we have the, the charging stations for some of those EV drivers at the North White Plains stations that the county executive um, opened up maybe during the middle of last year. We have the ability for those folks that are commuters to be able to park for free. And again, that's going to continue right through the end of August um, to be able to have free parking for those commuters. So whether you're taking public transportation or whether you're you know, taking your car to the train station to be able to commute into the city. Those are other opportunities and people should take advantage of those. We also announced that we had doubled the amount of investment in feeding Westchester. Looking at the inflation figures and county executive makes sure to point out every time county executive Latimer talks about what things we can do in Westchester County and be able to match the investments that we have and the ability to do the great resources with our state partners and federal partners and putting those resources where people need them. Feeding Westchester, we doubled the investment that we have in feeding Westchester from $700,000 to $1.4 million. And for a family of four that is taking advantage of the feeding Westchester scenario, that's a, a savings of $60 a week that they can achieve to be able to participate in the programs. And those pantries are all over and all throughout Westchester County. Feeding Westchester did a tremendous job throughout the pandemic and certainly moving forward, continue need for every person in Westchester County that has that opportunity to, to participate in a Feeding Westchester program. A 18% increase in year over year um, expenses for food. This is a valuable tool that's absolutely essential. And again, your county government, County Executive Latimer and our entire team are trying to make sure that we do everything possible to be able to assist you. We also have an, an item in front of the Board of Legislators, which is about sales tax in the county for fuel and heating oil. So that's the heating oil, and that's a, something that's gonna happen in the dead of winter. And you know what? The best thing the county executive made sure to do was to point out the real savings of that is not in the summer. No one's had the heat on right now. Everyone's blowing their air conditioner and doing the things that they have to do there. 
but for the heating season, the county tax, to reduce that county tax and eliminate the county taxes during heating season, which is December until the end of February, that's going to make a tremendous impact. And everyone that has gone through this last winter, seeing the, the bills spike, this is another opportunity to see how your county government is able to do what it can, where it can, to be able to reduce that. It's a piece of legislation that will be considered by the Board of Legislators, carefully deliberated, ensuring that we're not doing anything that's going to negatively impact the budget altogether. But it is another great proposal, and our partners on the County Board of Legislators will be able to take a look at that coming up soon. As we saw with the timing for the gas tax um, holiday, it has to be done at the beginning of a quarter. So the next time that we'd be able to do it um, physically anyway wouldn't be until September. So the best choice is to really do it where it can have the most impact. And again, County Executive's leadership with our team to make sure that we can get the biggest bang for the buck. And again, it'll be in front of the Board of Legislators for their consideration and due diligence as appropriate. Last thing, you know, we just had our great economic development team up talking about the opportunities with the job fairs, and they've had tremendous job fairs. The Catalyst for Diversity is a, a program of the Westchester Catalyst and our development from economic development, and the entire team continues to do so many things. But one of the things is that we have government jobs that are available. And what we have done, the county executive has waived the fees for civil service through December 31st. And that means it's the county portion of those fees. But not only that, for the individuals that apply for those jobs, we make sure, the county executive makes sure that our municipal partners are not being damaged by that. So we will make up the difference. There's a fee that goes to part goes to the state, and sometimes it goes to the local municipalities. What we're doing with those civil service fees, we're making sure everyone is whole. And for those people that would like to participate in a great government, like Westchester County or in their local municipalities, that we're waiving those fees until December 31st. That's a great time for everyone to be able to participate and find whatever things that may work for them and get involved in the opportunities in a great place like Westchester County where we have a tremendous team. Going back to you, George. Thank you. Thanks very much. Ken Jenkins, our Deputy County Executive. And I want to emphasize that uh, all of these ideas come out of a, a large group of people, our commissioners of various departments, uh, our executive team, Ken, John McDonald, Emily Saltzman, Andrew Ferris, Catherine Chaffee, John Nona, uh, Steve Bass, and Intergov. All of us uh, interact in, in various ways. And, and no one person is the author of any one of these particular ideas. And we have conversations. And uh, we hope to have some additional announcements of additional things that will come up in the weeks to come. But just to repeat it again. We have cut property taxes the last three years. We start with that. We've made buses free throughout the, uh, throughout the course of the summer. Now we've made it possible for you to go to a pool during the weekday and beaches and, and not have to pay to get into there. We have two commuter lots at the White Plains, North White Plains stations that don't require a fee. We've made more uh, food available through Feeding Westchester. We've suspended civil service uh, fees so that you can apply for a job if you're in the job hunting mode. And we're still looking at different things, including the legislation uh, to move forward on it. We understand that there's an economic problem in the society at large. We see that, uh, the causes of it and, and the ultimate solutions of it uh, rest more in Washington than they do in a town hall or county office building. But we see those issues and we're trying to address them in the same way that we see a fear of, uh, of crime and that there's a perception that crime is run rampant and we address that fear straightforwardly by the work that we do fully funding the police and then making sure we track just what kind of success level we have in fighting crime and fighting inflation. In addition to that, all of the other different enhancements, the things we do to make this county's recreation program work well, our county public health department, which we talked about in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, we don't report particularly today on what's happening at our correctional institution. We don't report particularly today on our environmental facilities that treat sewage. But every one of these parts of county government uh, that, that provide operational services, we are working to try to make sure that they, that they deliver those services reliably day to day. And without a lot of fanfare, without, you know, having parades and, you know, making a big thing of these things, but to do our job effectively every day. That's what you see in our economic development component uh, that we've talked about earlier today, and I could make the same case for five or six other components of county government where they're professional people working hard, using their own drive and determination to help us get across the finish line. That leads me to one more topic to discuss, which is Westchester County Airport. You've, uh, you've seen that we've made an effort uh, now, the beginning effort, to put together a master plan 
on the county airport. The last master plan in the county airport was completed in 1989, over 30 years ago. And uh, it is uh, now time for us to uh, re-envision the county airport and what we want to see accomplished out there. This past week, we had the fourth in our series of public forums. This was a virtual forum. We wanted to reach people uh, online because we know not everybody wants to come out to a public meeting. And for some people, the timing and the location of the public meetings we've had so far were not convenient for them. And we have had public uh, hearings in downtown White Plains at Pace Law School. We had one in Purchase at Manhattanville College. We had one in Dobbs Ferry at Mercy College. And now we've had the most recent one that was virtual. We had about 30 speakers. Uh, it was heavily skewed to those people who live around the airport and who live under the flight path, who are greatly concerned about the noise at the airport. It cannot be denied that Westchester County can be an obtrusive neighbor to those people who live in and around the airport. And some of the people who testified do not have the noise now, but they're concerned that any solution to the noise that makes the people who suffer from it now will wind up transferring the problem to them who live in adjacent corridors and adjacent communities. This makes it a very difficult issue for us to resolve, particularly given the fact that the county government does not control the flight paths that come into the county airport. So we heard people testify, the planes are flying too low. We can hear them the lower they fly, that's not within our direct control. Uh, we try to use our good uh, offices to reduce the number of flights that come in after 12 midnight or that, uh, you know, in, in the wee hours of the morning, not under our direct control. We don't have mandatory curfew authority. But as part of the master plan, we're going to try to put all of these factors into place. We have been working diligently to deal with any concerns about pollution, ground level pollution. That is our responsibility to fight so that it does not get into the drinking watershed or on the other side of the airport, drain out into the Long Island Sound via the Blind Brook. Uh, and also the size and the scope of the terminal, the size and scope of the various hangars uh, by the fixed-based operators, those that, that serve general aviation or private aviation, if you want to use it that way, making sure that the protections that we do have, the limits to the number of gates, the limits to the number of passenger per half hour, that those, uh, those protections uh, remain in place, and all of that will be in a document. We will have some additional public forums uh, upcoming. You're welcome to come to listen, to testify. We expect them to be in person in the weeks to come. We will have a number of them in other parts of the county. We're going to go into far reaches of the county as well. We, we know we've heard very strongly from the people who live in and around the airport under the flight paths. We want to make sure we at least give the opportunity for people in all corners of the county to be heard, whether in New Rochelle or Yonkers or Peekskill or wherever else we go. And we are going to at least hold one of these forums in Greenwich, Connecticut, because while it's a different state, different jurisdiction, they too are neighbors. And, and we are not exclusive in the way we view our responsibilities. We view it as inclusive and we want to hear from everybody. And as we take that input, we'll try to shape policies that we hope We'll lay out a game plan that, once it's completed, will be the roadmap for the next 20 years at the airport. Future administrations will have the opportunity to change plans or to modify uh, things that we put in place, but we think a master plan document is far better than where we were. There were proposals to privatize the airport in lieu of a master plan direction. Any idea may seem to be fair game, but losing public control of the airport does not seem like a wise idea. That's why we stopped efforts in that direction. And uh, it was not a wise idea to stop testing water near the airport. We reinstituted that. We locked those things into a master plan so that it's not just the whim of a particular administration, but it becomes part of the policy of Westchester County that we do these things to protect those situations at the airport. So there'll be more to report on the airport. Uh, as we go forward. And uh, with each of these different things, we'll continue to have our uh, Monday updates at 2 o'clock, try to cover all the different ground uh, that we have. Uh, let me ask uh, Lisa Reyes, who is our communications manager on the spot, if we have any public questions from the press. We do not. Uh, but any members of the press that are taking this as a feed are welcome to reach out to us at 914-995-2932. Uh, They'll reach Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications, and she'll be happy to uh, project those questions. If they're bound for any of our economic development team, for Ken or myself, we're happy to try to address them uh, and put those all together. I think in these reports, you get a sense of the scope of Westchester County government, that we have lots of different responsibilities, and we're trying our best in each of those different areas to address them. Some of them are things that you would see in a more direct basis, like going to one of our parks. Uh, this weekend, we had the Hispanic uh, Ethnic Heritage Festival. It was a great time. 
I can't dance salsa, but a lot of people who were good at it were dancing and uh, having a good time and enjoying food and, uh, and, and drink and uh, vendors and things of that nature. We have already had similar festivals for our African-American community, our Irish-American community. We've had it for the Polish-American community, the Albanian-American community. I may have left any out. We have upcoming uh, festivals for the Italian-American community, for the Jewish community, for the Muslim community. Uh, I've missed Asian American. We had Asian American uh, festivals. So we have some coming up. Uh, the South Asian or Indian uh, American festival, I believe, is, is coming up also very quickly. So we encourage you to come. You don't have to be part of any of those ethnic groups. Uh, Ken claims a couple of those ethnicities. <laughs> I claim a couple of those ethnicities. We go to all of them anyway. And we have just as much fun uh, drinking, eating, and trying to dance. You better dance than I am. But uh, uh, trying to have a good time at these events. And we encourage you to enjoy it. That's part of Westchester. We always talk about the mosaic of Westchester. The we, the first two letters of Westchester. The we in Westchester. That's what makes us stronger. And people you know, can say whatever they want. Our strong economic position is not because of the government of Westchester County. It's the people of of Westchester County, and this county is a more diverse population than most every other county outside of New York City in the state of New York. And that diversity is our strength. We have some of the brightest, most capable people in all fields of endeavor that come out of the Asian American community, come out of the South uh, Asian American community, come out of the Hispanic and the African American community, as well as the traditional European communities, the Irish, Italian, and uh, Polish, the Jewish communities. All of that makes a stronger county gives us a stronger economic base, gives us a more successful environment that we live in, and that's what attracts people to come to Westchester County. You'll hear people all the time saying, I can't make it in New York, uh, it's, uh, I gotta go, I gotta leave someplace else. People at various times in their life make those decisions. I'm at an age where many of my contemporaries aren't working in New York City. They don't need Metro North anymore. Their kids are not going to public schools, so the quality of the public education system is not of immediate need to them. And, you know, frankly, they'd like warmer weather in the wintertime. So they go south, and we, we wish them uh, an enjoyable rest of their life. But we find immediately, the minute that house in Dobbs Ferry goes on the market, it's a bidding war to try to get into Dobbs Ferry. It's a bidding war to get into Bronxville. It's a bidding war to get into North Salem because of the demand of what this county has. And uh, uh, I have at various times in my career, because of my corporate career, I've relocated outside of New York State, lived in a couple of other states over a period of time. Uh, there, there are wonderful places to live in, in uh, the country. And if your economics takes you there, then we wish you a terrific life while you're there. But while you're here in Westchester County, we are trying to provide for you the single best place to live that we know how. And that's what we're doing every day. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back again next week, and uh, we'll be on a municipal call in the next uh, hour or so to update our local officials on some of these issues as well. Thank you for watching. Be safe.